title, Subclinical Imaging Findings in Sports Horses, How Do We Determine Their Clinical Relevance? And I added to that, can we determine their clinical relevance? And I'm going to talk about this in relationship to sports horses. And really, we're asking the question from a practical point of view, can we make accurate predictions at pre-purchase examinations about the cl potential clinical significance or otherwise of findings? And I aim to discuss several anatomical areas to highlight the difficulties we face in radiological interpretation and review relevant literature where appropriate. And I put this out to you that I feel that to be a value, a test must be reliable and interpretation based on evidence-based knowledge. And that we should be able to accurately predict the clinical significance of findings. And it should be cost-effective and provide useful information over and above what can be acquired from our clinical assessment. Because otherwise, why are we doing it? So it's become increasingly in vogue for cervical radiographs to be acquired at pre-purchase examination. So I'm going to address this area first. And so say, OK, where do you image? Is it from the occiput to C7? Or do we do it actually through to T1? If we go only go to <coughs> C7, we miss the fact that there's subluxation at C7, T1. But some of you won't be able to radiograph T1 with your portable X-ray machines. So you are giving the potential purchaser incomplete information if you've only radiographed to C7. And how do we interpret what we find? This horse has got enthesias new bone on the caudal aspect of the occiput. This is an advanced three-day event horse with no clinical signs referable to this. And I would put it to you that there are many, many normal horses which have such radiological findings. These are two horses performing completely normally. This horse has not done much, as it's only a three-year-old warm blood stallion, and this is a 10-year-old Grand Prix dressage horse. Both horses have subluxation at C3-4. In the horse on the right, we also have very short pedicles of C3 and C4, so very low slung articular process joints with marked narrowing of the intervertebral foramina. But these are horses performing clinically normally, I've got follow-up information for each of these horses for four years. They have continued to perform clinically normally. This horse was a very highly successful dressage horse, competed internationally and won. The reason its neck was x-rayed was because there was slight loss of muscle on the top line, which reflected the fact that this horse was slightly bilaterally lame behind. But when we radiographed its neck, we see that we have got massive asymmetrical enlargement of the articular process joints between C6 and C7. We've got a very abnormal articulation between the articular process joints at C7 and T1. And we have a transposition of the ventral processes from C6 to C7. And then we have a cranially directed uh, spinous process of T1, all of which I would regard as abnormal. But this horse has got no related clinical signs. What would you do with this at a pre-purchase examination? If you were covering your ass, you would say, don't buy this horse. You'd lose one of the best horses in the world. Now, this transposition of ventral processes from the caudal aspect of C6 to C7 has become very much in vogue as being potentially something that may be of clinical significance. And this has done, uh, been um, uh, driven by Sharon May Davis, who was um, not the first to describe this, because in the first edition of Clinical Radiology of the Horse, you will find this described. But she has done a number of anatomical stu studies, and she's demonstrated very nicely that you can have unilateral transposition or bilateral transposition. And in association with that, we often see asymmetry of the ventral neck musculature, as we see here. And her first work was based on thoroughbred horses and thoroughbred crosses. And she had a small number of clinical cases with rather ill-defined clinical signs, which she related to these radiological abnormalities. There has been a suggestion that the presence of um, transposition of ventral processes from C6 to C7 
may be associated with asymmetry of the articular process joints as well. Because remember, we've got asymmetry of the ventral musculature. Maybe that predisposes to asymmetry of enlargement of the articular process joints. And in this particular horse, we can see that there was massive asymmetry of the articular process joints. This was a horse which had caudal neck pain, but its caudal neck pain was associated with a congenital abnormality of the first rib and the brachial plexus being involved with that first rib an anomaly. So is there any evidence-based information to indicate that horses with such congenital abnormalities are at increased risk of uh, neck-related problems. There are a number of publications which have described the frequency of occurrence of these congenital abnormalities, but to date there is very limited evidence about the relationship between clinical signs. We are currently doing a prospective study in conjunction with the University of uh, Davis, California, so every horse which is going to radiography is having its neck X, caudal neck x-rayed, and we are relating it to the presence or absence of clinical signs. And uh, we've got to do all the final num number crunching, but I think we will see that there are many horses with these congenital abnormalities which have no related clinical signs whatsoever. <coughs> So what about the significance of changes of the articular process joints? Here we can see a horse with a spur formation on the ventral aspect of this enlarged articular process joint. This articular process joint has what we call ventral buttressing. The ventral aspect of the joint is contacting the um, vertebral body. And here again, we have considerable enlargement of an articular process joint. But of what clinical significance are these changes? Because if we were to radiograph... 100 horses, mature horses, a very large percentage will show such radiological changes. Uh, Shelley Down and Fran Henson um, did a study when they looked at horses with and without clinical signs of neck-related pathology. They developed um, a grading system for describing the radiological changes, and they looked at the relationship between age and clinical signs and the presence or absence of these radiological findings. They did see a significant effect of age at C5-6, but no significant effect in the grade at C6-7. There was no significant difference in the C5-6 and C6-7 grades with breed, sex, or work discipline, and no significant association between the presence and type of clinical signs and the grades at either C5-6 and C6-7. So that's, I think, a quite, quite important piece of work. Now, if you decide to acquire radiographs, I think it's really important that you interpret them correctly. This was a five-year-old warm blood stallion dressage horse, which underwent a pre-purchase examination, and these radiographs were acquired at the time of purchase. Now, for a five-year-old, I would say that these are extreme changes involving particularly um, C67 um, and C7T1 profound changes. The horse was recommended for purchase with no description of any radiological change and no suggestion that the horse was at increased risk of de the development of clinical signs. Unfortunately, the horse became ataxic within three months of purchase. The purchaser unsuccessfully sued the vendor. However, the judge found the veterinarian duty of, neg of negligence because he failed to describe the radiological changes that were clearly present and failed to discuss with the owner their potential clinical significance. So take home message is if you acquire radiographs, at least describe accurately what you find and then try and document the risk if we can. Now, in contrast, this was another horse which was undergoing a pre-purchase examination. It has got enlarged articular process joints between uh, C6 and C7. These were described, and the horse has not had any clinical problems related to the neck subsequently. This was a five-year-old, no, sorry, six-year-old, um, successfully show jumping. Um, radiographs were acquired. Um, here we've got marked subluxation at um, C6-7. Uh, and this horse, um, as I say, had no <coughs> clinical signs related to the neck, but subsequently developed ataxia. 
So I think if you see something like this, you've really got to say, well, although the horse may be clinically normal now and competing successfully, uh, that's not to say it's going to go on to do so. So going back to my initial pre premise that to be a value, a test must be reliable and interpretation based on evidence-based knowledge, with respect to the neck, I think we still have rather limited evidence-based knowledge. We said, or I suggested, that it ought to be able to accurately predict the clinical significance of findings. And I would say, particularly since we've been radiographing necks of all the horses that we evaluate, I would find it very, very difficult to interpret the clinical, potential clinical significance of many of the changes that we see in mature sports horses. The test should be cost effective and provide useful information over and above what can be acquired from clinical assessment. I think it potentially throws doubt in a purchaser's mind because if you say, okay, this horse has got advanced osteoarthritis at C5-6 and C6-7, I can't tell you what the likely significance of this is or not. Some purchasers are going to walk away from the horse particularly if it's going to be a horse that is going to be insured because there are going to be difficulties with acquiring insurance cover. So you've potentially wrecked a sale just by acquiring radiographs of the horse's neck. And I don't think that that's a particularly good situation to be in personally. So we're going to move on to some other areas now. And first of all, to discuss the potential significance or otherwise of these proximal plantar fragments of the medial tubercle of the talus. In our hospital population, we see this in about 8% of horses that undergo hock radiography. And uh, Paolo Espinosa from UC Davis um, did a, a nice but small study when uh, he was based in Canada and did a retrospective study of more than 1,500 horses which had undergone tarsal radiography. And they looked at the breed distribution and the clinical features of horses with these fragments. Uh, and uh, they just compared them also with some um, cadaver studies. And so from this population of more than 1,500 horses, they only found a 0.59% prevalence. So they only identified these fragments in eight horses. Um, one of which had bilateral lesions. So that's considerably lower than the prevalence in our clinical population. The horses range in age from 1 to 12 with a mean of 5. Warm bloods predominated, and they were used for a variety of different disciplines. And they concluded that none of the horses had clinical signs that they believe were referable to the presence of these fragments, which varied in their size and position. Although actually... They said they were no, no, of no clinical significance, but one of the horses actually underwent arthroscopic surgery to try and identify and remove the fragment, and they couldn't see the fragment. Um, so what is the pathogenesis of, of these um, uh, osseous fragments? Is it an unusual manifestation of osteochondrosis? In a survey done by Gatti, they evaluated 62 horses which were assessed at three years of age, and they found a 3.2% prevalence. And uh, Ver Wilgren looked at 676 potential breeding stallions, and they found a prevalence of 1%. We believe that they may also develop as a result of tension in the medial talocalcaneal ligament or the tarsal plantar ligament. And also, there is the potential for um, an avulsion of the short medial collateral ligament of the tarsocrural joint. I have seen one horse in which I know from previous radiographs that the fragment was not present. The horse had an acute onset of lameness with no localizing clinical signs. Lameness was abolished by tibial and fibular nerve blocks. And uh, a fragment was then identified which had not previously been there. So I think that they rarely can be associated with a problem. So if I were to see them at a pre-purchase examination, I would say, I think we've got reasonably strong evidence that these are unlikely to be of clinical significance. Now, an area which causes a lot of problems are spurs on the dorsal proximal aspect of the third metatarsal bone. They are common and they are a frequent reason for insurance companies refusing to cover problems associated with the hocks. So 
What is their clinical significance? Can we interpret their clinical significance? We know they may be periarticular osteophytes, but also they could potentially be enthesiophytes at the insertion of either fibularis tertius or cranialis tibialis or um, other ligaments. So uh, Alison Fairburn did a retrospective study of 455 horses which had undergone tarsal radiography for a variety of different reasons and found a prevalence of 25%. And 13% of the horses with bilateral radiographs had bilateral spurs. There was no significant difference in the frequency of the presence of such a spur between lame horses and non-lame horses. There was also no significant difference between their frequency of presence between horses with other causes of hindum lameness, unrelated to the HOC region, or those with either proximal suspensory desmopathy and or distal tarsal joint pain. But the presence of an osseous spur was significantly associated with the grade of radiological abnormality of the distal tarsal joints, evidence of osteoarthritis. Unfortunately, there have been no longitudinal studies to monitor the progression of radiological changes. I've seen several horses that I've monitored over the years which had a tiny spur initially and then finished up with massive development of periarticular osteophytes in both involving both the tarsal metatarsal joint and the central distal joint with associated lameness. So I think it's very, very difficult to make an accurate prediction. So I think insurance companies are absolutely justified in saying these horses do represent an increased risk, but that risk is unquantifiable. In normal horses, the interosseous space is occupied by interosseous ligaments in both the centrodistal and tarsometatarsal joints. And sometimes we see mineralization and loss of the well-defined margins of that interosseous space radiologically. So what does that mean? Esther Skelly-Smith reviewed the radiographs of 1,170 limbs and found a prevalence of 16.6% with ossification of the centrodistal into osseous space. And bilateral abnormalities were identified in approximately 11% of those horses which were evaluated uh, bilaterally. An abnormality of the interosseous ligament was associated with increased odds of osteoarthritis of the centrodistal joint, with a very large um, uh, odds ratio, but also very large confidence intervals. But that means that if you see mineralization of this interosseous space, it behoves you to very carefully evaluate the uh, structure of the centrodistal and tarsometatarsal joints to evaluate very carefully the presence or absence of other evidence of pathological change within the joint. Osteochondral fragments on the craniodistal aspect of the intermediate ridge of the tibia occur in all sorts of configurations and sizes. And I think from a clinician's point of view, I would say the larger the fragment, the more likely I think there is to be uh, associated clinical signs. Uh, and we know that if a fragment has been moving around the joint for some considerable time, we can certainly get pathological changes uh, are consistent with osteoarthritis with these full thickness cartilage lesions. So if they're big and mobile, they are highly likely at some stage in the horse's life, I think, to potentially create a clinical problem. But actually, despite the high frequency of occurrence of these and radiographs of young horses, particularly young warm bloods, there is surprisingly little evidence-based information on which we can make a judgment about the size of the fragment that is likely, or any other radiological abnormality associated with them that is likely to indicate clinical significance or otherwise. We know that plenty of horses with small fragments, those fragments sit there innocuously throughout the horse's competitive life, but we have no evidence really to give us a cutoff as to where these fragments may or may not be of clinical significance in the future. I'm now going to talk about various aspects of the foot, specifically the front feet, 
and I'm going to use this by clinical examples. This was an eight-year-old warm blood show jumper mare who had won 247 pounds the previous season. This is in March when the pre-purchase examination radiographs are acquired. The horse had not competed since the previous October for no disclosed reason. And the horse was with a dealer to sell. The horse underwent radiographic examination. We can see clearly that there is extensive ossification of one of the uh, ungular cartilages. We can also see that we have got a horizontal orientation of the distal border of the distal phalanx. The veterinarian who performed the pre-purchase examination um, uh, uh, acquired these radiographs and said that he considered this horse was a normal p uh, risk for purchase. This horse was going to change in its work discipline. It was being sold uh, as to somebody who was going to produce it as an event horse with the potential for resale. Um, we know, there are lots of studies now, that extensive ossification, especially that which is asymmetrical, has been linked to a variety of different injuries involving the ungular cartilages themselves, um, the base and underlying distal phalanx uh, with fractures, and as, Adam, as Mariana described this morning, an association also with ligamentous injuries to so the collateral ligaments of the distal interphalangeal joint or the chondrocoronal or chondrocesamoidean ligaments. We also know that in some horses, we don't just get ossification of the ungular cartilages, we get secondary modeling changes. So we get change in shape of the ungular cartilages, we get changes in the opacity, um, we can get changes in the margins of the compact bone, um, and we can get changes in orientation. And we have shown that horses with extensive ossification, that's grades four or grade five, are much more likely to have these secondary modelling changes compared to horses with lesser degrees of ossification. We also know that abnormally shaped cartilages are more likely to have modelling or adaptive changes. So a cartilage that bends outwards or curves inwards proximally or has a bulbous shape or palmar curvature are all more likely to have secondary modelling changes. And those secondary modelling changes probably make the cartilages stiffer. And their function is to dissipate energy. Uh, and if they become stiffer, they may be less able to do this efficiently, which may predispose to further modelling or adaptive changes. Increased radiopacity is consistent with increased bone density, which may be the result of chronic fatigue damage or healing or possibly the, causes, the forces that cause the initial ossification. We believe that with increased bone density, the bones have increased propensity for bone trauma or fracture. So when we looked at a series of horses, we had 42 horses, 11 based on scintigraphy and 31 based on MRI, with an injury to an ossified cartilage identified as a contributing factor to lameness. And more than nearly 65% of these had grade 4 or grade 5 ossification. But to put this into perspective, we also had 24% of horses which had grade 4 or 5 ossification. But the final primary diagnosis for the cause of lameness was related to other lesions, such as a lesion of the deep diddle flexor tendon. But the question that then arises in my mind is, could that extensive ossification have predisposed to those other injuries? And that's a question that we can't answer. But going back to our clinical case, the horse that was purchased as this horse to go on as an event horse, 2.5 months after purchase, after the completion of two British Eventing 100 events, this horse went lame. And the horse blocked to its foot, and radiographs were acquired. And these occluded oblique radiographs. And we can see this, um, what looks like a chronic fracture, at the base of this extensively ossified ungular cartilage. So I think my take-home message on this is that we should not ignore extensively ossified ungular cartilages at pre-purchase examinations of sports horses. Then the question um, that also arises is, how do we consider the significance or otherwise of the orientation of the solar border of the distal phalanx?
Um, uh, Mariana indicated to us this morning that there is conflicting evidence about the relationship with deep digital flexor tendon lesions and um, the, a horizontal orientation of the distal phalanx. Elia Shah and co-workers showed that um, by increasing the um, angle of the distal phalanx just by one degree, you reduce force on the palmar aspect of the navicular bone by 4%. And so they suggested that um, this angle of the solar margin was important with respect to the forces on both the deep digital flexor tendon and the navicular bone. But we have lack of evidence-based knowledge about the level of risk for future lameness. Um, and I enter this idea, what about trauma of the palmar processes of the distal phalanx with this type of distal phalanx orientation. I think we have an increasing amount of evidence that this um, orientation of the distal phalanx may be a predisposing factor for trauma to the palmar processes, which can result in chronic low-grade lameness. Mariana addressed a little bit the subject of distal border fragments of the navicular bone. This is another pre-purchase examination. Um, we can see that this horse has also got a horizontal border of the distal phalanx. These were the radiographs sent to me for my opinion. This was a seven-year-old warm blood currently competing at 1 meter 30. It has a consistent competition record. It has a very large purchase price. The purchaser wants to use this horse potentially as a five-star Grand Prix horse. He says the horse is not overtly lame. The horse had a very athletic canter and jump. But the purchaser's comments were, in the absolutely ideal world, I would prefer him to have a lighter and springier and more athletic trot. But that may be just my personal opinion. Words said by the purchaser. And he's a very astute businessman and a very good rider. But he trotted up soundly on small circles to the left and to the right um, on a hard surface. We don't always know, from a radiographic perspective, the etiology of these fragments. They could reflect fractures, they may re represent separate centres of ossification, or they could represent dystrophic mineralisation in the distal sesamoidium and impar ligament. And we can't determine their etiology. We know that in some horses they are associated with other pathological changes of the navicular bone, but they may, as in this horse, be seen as a single entity. We don't know whether or not they are congenital or acquired. But what we do know is that there have been several studies that indicate that they occur much more frequently in horses with foot pain than in horses which were free from lameness and undergoing pre-purchase examinations. We also know that a fragment alone, without any other radiological change, can be a cause of lameness. Uh, we also know that they are within the distal sesamoidian impar ligament, which is a highly innovated structure, uh, which mean, and with lots of um, substance P and calcitonin G related peptide, um, which is going to transmit pain. So if we find a fragment, we're in the situation when we cannot predict accurately what will go, is going to happen in the future. I know horses which have been purchased with fragments that subsequently went lame and in which subsequently the fragment was confirmed as the likely cause of the lameness. But I'm also fully aware of horses that were purchased with fragments that competed very successfully throughout their athletic careers. So we cannot quantify the risk. So this horse has the fragment and also this uh, um, horizontal orientation of the um, distal phalanx, which was associated with relatively low heel conformation. So a reflection of the hoof capsule shape in this horse. So in this particular case, I think we have to go through a thought process. We have to say, OK, this horse is competing very successfully at 1 meter 30, but we're going to ask it to jump 1 meter 50 or 1 meter 60. So the athletic demands on this horse are going to increase substantially. If this distal border fragment became a problem, we have no effective treatment. We 
know or we think that the distal border of the distal phalanges orientation may be important with respect to forces delivered to the deep diddle flexor tendon and the navicular bone. But we know that some horses with distal border fragments have been successful athletes. The risks are difficult to quantify, but the horse's trot quality could potentially reflect subclinical pain. So I left it at that with the purchaser. The purchaser decided to err on the side of caution and did not buy the horse. And I did get the opportunity to follow this horse, and this horse has disappeared off the jumping scene. So it was probably a wise decision. I don't know why it disappeared from the jumping scene, but I think it was a wise decision on his part. So I've presented a series of cases to show you where we do have evidence and to show you areas where we don't have evidence and to show you some of the thought processes that we, that we need to go through. So can we and how do we determine their clinical relevance if we find subclinical imaging findings? And I say sometimes we can do so based on evidence, but sometimes we don't have evidence. But, and these are really important prerequisites. Excellent image quality is a prerequisite for accurate interpretation and is essential to read images correctly. And this was brought home to me very recently. I was asked to review the radiographs of 10 lots that were being sold through the re recent Brightwell's uh, sales of dressage horses. And all of these horses had, had been presented with radiographs which had been read and interpreted and there were radiological reports available for you to see. Unfortunately, the radiological reports were pretty inaccurate because in 85% of these horses, there were lesions that were missed. So although the radiographs had been read by a veterinarian and a report uh, produced, he had failed to properly, in my opinion, read the radiographs uh, accurately. So I think that in the pre-purchase examination situation, it is really, really important that we very carefully evaluate the radiographs that we acquire and that we document what we observe and we try and evaluate the risk if we possibly can. If we document everything, then we're in the clear because the, vet, the purchaser has to make the decision. It's if we fail to document accurately, if we fail to recognize lesions, that that's when we are going to be um, in a potentially difficult situation. I do believe that evidence-based information needs to increase. And um, I will just throw it out that I've bought and sold quite a lot of horses in my life, and I never x-rayed any horse that I bought. Um, and I did a review of pre-purchase examinations several years ago when we reviewed uh, 150 horses who had undergone pre-purchase examinations and who were clinically acceptable. Um, and there was only one of those 150 horses that was subsequently not purchased based on radiological findings. So I thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to try and answer any questions.